Friedrich Ebert, the 4th of February 1871, the 28th of February 1925, was a German politician of the Social Democratic Party of Germany and the first president of Germany from 1919 until his death in office in 1925. Ebert was elected leader of the SPD on the death in 1913 of August Bebel. In 1914, shortly after he assumed leadership, the party became deeply divided over Ebert's support of war loans to finance the German war effort in World War I. A moderate Social Democrat, Ebert was in favor of the Berg Frieden, a political policy that sought to suppress squabbles over domestic issues among political parties during wartime in order to concentrate all forces in society on the successful conclusion of the war effort. He tried to isolate those in the party opposed to the war, but could not prevent a split. Ebert was a pivotal figure in the German Revolution of 1918-19. When Germany became a republic at the end of World War I, he became its first chancellor. His policies at that time were primarily aimed at restoring peace and order in Germany, and suppressing the left. In order to accomplish these goals, he allied himself with conservative and nationalistic political forces, in particular the leadership of the military under General Wilhelm Gruner and the right-wing Freikorps. With their help, Ebert's government crushed a number of socialist and communist uprisings as well as those from the right, including the Cap Putsch, a legacy that has made him a controversial historical figure. Chapter 1 – Early Life Ebert was born in Heidelberg in the German Empire, on 4 February 1871, the seventh of nine children of the tailor Karl Ebert and his wife Katharina. Three of his siblings died at a young age. Although he wanted to attend university, this proved impossible due to his family's lack of funds. Instead, he trained as a saddle maker from 1885 to 1888. After he became a journeyman in 1889 he traveled, according to the German custom, from place to place in Germany, seeing the country and learning fresh details of his trade. In Mannheim, he was introduced by an uncle to the Social Democratic Party, joining it in 1889. Although Ebert studied the writings of Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels, he was less interested in ideology than in practical and organizational issues that would improve the lot of the workers then and there. Ebert was placed on a police blacklist, due to his political activities, so he kept changing his place of residence. Between 1889 and 1891, he lived in Kassel, Braunschweig, Elberfeld Barmen, Remscheid, Quakenbrook, and Bremen, where he founded and chaired local chapters of the Sattler Band. After settling in Bremen in 1891, Ebert made a living doing odd jobs. In 1893, he obtained an editorial post on the socialist Bremer Burger Zeitung. In May 1894, he married Louise Rump, daughter of a manual laborer, who had been employed as a housemaid and in labeling boxes and who was active in union work. He then became a pub owner that became a center of socialist and union activity and was elected party chairman of the Bremen SPD. In 1900, Ebert was appointed a trade union secretary, and elected a member of the Bremer Burgerschaft as the representative of the Social Democratic Party. In 1904, Ebert presided over the National Convention of the Party in Bremen and became better known to a wider public. He became a leader of the moderate wing of the Social Democratic Party, and in 1905 Secretary General of the SPD, at which point he moved to Berlin. At the time, he was the youngest member of the party stand. Meanwhile, Ebert had run for a seat in the Reichstag several times in constituencies where the SPD had no chance of winning, 1898 Feshtar, 1903, and 1906 Schada. However, in 1912, he was elected to the Reichstag for the constituency of Elberfeld Barmen. This was the election that also made the SPD the strongest party in the Reichstag with 110 out of a total of 397 members surpassing the Centre Party. On the death of August Bebel on 13 August 1913, Ebert was elected as Joint Party Chairman at the Convention in Jena on 20 September with 433 out of 473 votes. His co-chairman was Hugo Haas. Chapter 2, World War I 
When the July crisis of 1914 erupted, Ebert was on vacation. After war was declared in early August, Ebert traveled to Zurich with party treasurer Otto Braun and the SPD's money to be in a position to build up a foreign organization if the SPD should be outlawed in the German Empire. He returned on 6 August and led the SPD Reichstag members to vote almost unanimously in favor of war loans, accepting that the war was a necessary patriotic, defensive measure, especially against the autocratic regime of the Tsar in Russia. In January 1916, Haas resigned. Under the leadership of Ebert and other moderates such as Philip Scheidemann, the SPD party participated in the Bergfrieden, an agreement among the political parties in the Reichstag to suppress domestic policy differences for the duration of the war in order to concentrate the energies of the country solely on bringing the conflict to a successful conclusion for Germany. This positioned the party in favor of the war with the aim of a compromise peace, a stance that eventually led to a split in the SPD, with those radically opposed to the war leaving the SPD in early 1917 to form the USPD. Similar policy disputes caused Ebert to end his parliamentary alliance with several left-wing members of the Reichstag and start to work closely with the Centre Party and the Progress Party in 1916. Later those kicked out by Ebert called themselves Spartacists. Beginning in 1916, Ebert shared the leadership of his Reichstag delegates with Scheidemann. Although he opposed a policy of territorial gains, secured through military conquest on the Western Front, Ebert supported the war effort overall as a defensive struggle. Ebert experienced the traumatic loss of having two of his four sons killed in the war, Heinrich died in February 1917 in Macedonia, whereas Georg was killed in action in May 1917 in France. In June 1917, a delegation of Social Democrats led by Ebert traveled to Stockholm for talks with socialists from other countries about a conference that would have sought to end the war without any annexations of territory on the Western Front except for Luxembourg and giving back most of Alsace and Lorraine with blessings from the German government. The initiative failed, however. In January 1918, when the workers in munition factories in Berlin went on strike, Ebert joined the strike leadership but worked hard to get the strikers back to work. He was pilloried by a few politicians from the extremist left as a traitor to the working class, and from the right as a traitor to the fatherland. Kaiser Wilhelm II and most politicians from both sides considered him an upstanding person and hero for getting them back to work non-violently. Chapter 3, Revolution of 1918-19 Chapter 4 Section 1 parliamentization. As the war continued, the military supreme command, nominally headed by Paul von Hindenburg, but effectively controlled by his subordinate Erich Ludendorff, became the de facto ruler of Germany. When it became clear that the war was lost in late summer and fall of 1918, Ludendorff started to favor the parliamentization of the German Empire, i.e. a transfer of power to those parties that held the majority in the Reichstag. The goal was to shift the blame for the military defeat from the OHL to the politicians of the majority parties. On 29 September 1918, Ludendorff suddenly informed Paul von Hintze, the German foreign minister, that the Western Front could collapse at any moment, and that a ceasefire had to be negotiated without delay. However, he suggested that the request for the ceasefire should come from a new government sanctioned by the Reichstag majority. In his view, a revolution from above was needed. Chancellor Georg von Hertling and Kaiser Wilhelm II agreed, although the former resigned. Scheidemann and a majority of SPD deputies were opposed to joining a bankrupt enterprise, but Ebert convinced his party, arguing that we must throw ourselves into the breach and it is our damned duty to do it. In early October, the Kaiser appointed a liberal, Prince Maximilian of Baden, as Chancellor to lead peace negotiations with the Allies. The new government for the first time included ministers from the SPD, Philipp Scheidemann and Gustav Bauer. The request for a ceasefire went out on 4 October. On 5 October, the government informed the German public about these events. However, there was then a delay, as the American President Wilson initially refused to agree to the ceasefire. His diplomatic notes seem to indicate 
that the changes to the German government were insufficient and the fact that Wilhelm II remained head of state was a particular obstacle. Ebert did not favor exchanging the monarchy for a republic, but like many others, he was worried about the danger of a socialist revolution, which seemed more likely with every day that passed. On 28 October, the constitution was changed to transfer power to the Reichstag. At this point, the majority parties of the Reichstag, including Ebert's SPD, were quite satisfied with the state of affairs, what they now needed was a period of calm to deal with the issue of negotiating an armistice, and a peace treaty. Chapter 4 Section 2, November Revolution The plans of the new German government were thrown into disarray when a confrontation between officers and crews on board the German fleet at Wilhelmshaven on 30 October set in motion a train of events that would result in a revolution, that spread over a substantial part of the country over the next week. Against the backdrop of a country falling into anarchy, the SPD led by Ebert on 7 November demanded a more powerful voice in the cabinet, an extension of parliamentarism to the state of Prussia, and the renunciation of the throne by both the emperor and his oldest son, Crown Prince Wilhelm. Ebert had favored retaining the monarchy under a different ruler, but at this time told Prince Maximilian von Baden, if the Kaiser does not abdicate, the social revolution is inevitable. But I do not want it, I even hate it like sin. On the left, the Spartacists and a group of around 80 to 100 popular labor leaders, from Berlin known as revolutionary stewards prepared for a revolution in the capital. On the 9th of November, the revolution reached Berlin as the larger companies were hit by a general strike called by the Spartacists and the revolutionary stewards, but also supported by the SPD and the mainstream unions. Workers and soldiers' councils were created and important buildings occupied. As the striking masses marched on the center of Berlin, the SPD, afraid of losing its influence on the revolution, announced that it was resigning from the government of Prince Maximilian. Meanwhile, Prince Maximilian had failed to convince Emperor Wilhelm II, who was at the army headquarters at Spa, Belgium, of the need to abdicate. Wilhelm had resigned himself to the loss of the imperial crown, but still thought he could remain king of Prussia. When Maximilian failed to convince him of the unreality of this belief, he unilaterally and untruthfully announced that Wilhelm had in fact abdicated and that the crown prince had agreed to relinquish his right of succession. Shortly thereafter, the SPD leadership arrived at the chancellery and Ebert asked Prince Maximilian to hand over the government to him. After a short meeting of the cabinet, the chancellor resigned and, in an unconstitutional move, handed his office over to Ebert, who thus became Chancellor of Germany and Minister-President of Prussia, the first socialist, the second politician and the second commoner to hold either office. Ebert left the government of Prince Maximilian mostly unchanged, but appointed SPD operatives for the Prussian Minister of War and for the military commander of the Berlin area. Ebert's first action as Chancellor was to issue a series of proclamations asking the people to remain calm, stay out of the streets and to restore peace and order. It failed to work. Ebert then had lunch with Scheidemann at the Reichstag and, when asked to do so, refused to speak to the masses gathered outside. Scheidemann however seized upon the opportunity, and in hopes of forestalling whatever the communist leader Karl Liebknecht was telling his followers at the now former royal palace, proclaimed Germany a republic. A furious Ebert promptly reproached him, you have no right to proclaim the republic. By this he meant that the decision was to be left to an elected national assembly, even if that decision might be the restoration of the monarchy. Later that day, Ebert even asked Prince Maximilian to stay on as regent, but was refused. Since Wilhelm II had not actually abdicated on 9 November, Germany legally remained a monarchy until the emperor signed his formal abdication on 28 November. But when Wilhelm handed over supreme command of the army to Paul von Hindenburg and left for the Netherlands on the morning of 10 November, the country was effectively without a head of state. An entirely socialist provisional government based on workers' councils was about to take power under Ebert's leadership. It was called the Council of the People's Deputies. Ebert found himself in a quandary. He had succeeded in bringing the SPD to power, and he was now in a position to put into law social reforms and improve the lot of the working class. 
yet as a result of the revolution, he and his party were forced to share power with those on the left whom he despised, the Spartacists and the Independents. In the afternoon of the 9th of November, he grudgingly asked the USBD to nominate three ministers for the future government. Yet that evening a group of several hundred followers of the revolutionary stewards occupied the Reichstag building and were holding an impromptu debate. They called for the election of soldiers and workers' councils the next day with an eye to name a provisional government, the Council of the People's Deputies. In order to keep control of events and against his own anti-revolutionary convictions, Ebert decided that he needed to co-opt the workers' councils and thus become the leader of the revolution while at the same time serving as the formal head of the German government. On the 10th of November, the SPD, led by Ebert, managed to ensure that a majority of the newly elected workers' and soldiers' councils came from among their own supporters. Meanwhile, the USBD agreed to work with him and share power in the Council of the People's Deputies, the new revolutionary government. Ebert announced the pact between the two socialist parties to the assembled councils who were eager for a unified socialist front and approved the parity of three members each coming from SBD and USBD. Ebert and Haas for the USBD were to be the joint chairman. That same day, Ebert received a telephone call from OHL Chief of Staff Wilhelm Gruner, who offered to cooperate with him. According to Gruner, he promised Ebert the loyalty of the military in exchange for some demands, a fight against Bolshevism, an end to the system of soldiers and workers' councils, a national assembly and a return to a state of law and order. This initiated a regular communication between the two that involved daily telephone conversations over a secret line, according to Gruner. The agreements between the two became known as the Ebert-Gruner Pact. Chapter 4 Section 3 Council of the People's Deputies In domestic policy, a number of social reforms were quickly introduced by the Council of the People's Deputies under Ebert's leadership, including unemployment benefits, the eight-hour workday, universal suffrage for everyone over the age of 20, the right of farmhands to organize, and increases in workers' old age, sick and unemployment benefits. A decree of 12 November 1918 established the Rye Office for Economic Demobilization, with the purpose of carrying the German economy over to peace conditions. On the 22nd of November 1918, a regulation was issued by the Rye Food Office for election to peasants and workers' councils which were subscribed to by all agricultural associations. On 23 November 1918, the Rye Office for Economic Demobilization issued 12 regulations which set forth rules governing duration of the working day, sick leaves, paid vacations, and other aspects of labor relations within the German economy. A decree of the Office for Economic Demobilization made on 9 December 1918 provided that the state governments should require the communes and communal unions to establish departments for general vocational guidance, and for placement of apprentices. On 23 November 1918, an order was introduced prohibiting work in bakeries between the hours of 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. In December 1918, the income limit for entitlement to health insurance coverage was raised from 2,500 to 5,000 marks. The right of free assembly and association, which was extended even to government workers and officials, was made universal, and all censorship was abolished. The Jessen Viordnung was revoked, and all discriminatory laws against agricultural workers were removed. A provisional order on 24 January 1919 provided various rights for agricultural workers. In addition, provisions for labor protection were restored, and a number of decrees were issued establishing freedom of the press, religious freedom, and freedom of speech, and amnesty of political prisoners. Protections for home workers were also improved, and housing provision was increased. A decree of 23 December 1918 regulated wage agreements laying down that a wage agreement that had been concluded in any branch of employment between the competent trade union authority and the competent employer's authority had absolute validity, meaning that no employer could enter into any other agreement of his own initiative. In addition, an organization of arbitral courts was set up to decide all disputes. 
A decree of 4 January 1919 compelled employers to reinstate their former laborers on demobilization, while measures were devised to safeguard workers from arbitrary dismissal. Workers who felt that they had been treated unfairly could appeal to an arbitration court, and in case of necessity the demobilization authorities had the power to determine who should be dismissed and who should be retained in employment. On 29 November 1918, the denial of voting rights to welfare recipients was repealed. A government proclamation of December 1918 ordered farmers to re employ returning soldiers at their former working place and to provide work for the unemployed, while an important decree was issued that same month in support of Ju Jean Fledge. In December 1918, the government granted provisionally the continuation of a maternity allowance introduced during the Great War while a decree issued in January 1919 mandated the employment of disabled veterans. A settlement decree was issued by the government on 29 January 1919 concerning the acquisition of land for the settlement of workers on the land that foresaw the possibility of expropriating estates over 100 hectares to facilitate settlement. However, only just over 500,000 hectares were freed by 1928, benefiting 2.4% of the farming population. In addition, Ebert's government got food supplies moving again and issued various decrees related to the promotion of civil aviation and restrictions on firearm possession. Chapter 4 Section 4 Civil War In the weeks following the creation of the Council of the People's Deputies, Ebert and the leadership of the SPD sided with the conservative and nationalistic elements in German society against the forces of the revolution. The latter wanted to eliminate the challenge to the existing order posed by the workers' councils as soon as possible. Yet the majority of those in the workers' and soldiers' councils viewed themselves as supporters of the government. It was only the Spartacists who wanted a dictatorship of the workers. Ebert and Gruner worked out a program to restore order in Berlin by having army units returning from the Western Front move in and disarm all paramilitary forces from 10 to 15 December. However, after the ten divisions had arrived, rather than remaining as a cohesive force, they dispersed. On 16 December, the Reichsrat Congress met in Berlin and set the date for elections to the National Assembly for 19 January 1919. However, it also passed a resolution that was aimed at ensuring that the military would be under the strict control of the civilian government, i.e. the Council of the People's Deputies. It also called for a powerful position of the soldiers' councils vis-à-vis -vis the professional officer corps. This was unacceptable to the leaders of the military and the OHL began to establish volunteer regiments in the Berlin area. Fighting erupted on 24 December on the Schlossplatz in Berlin. On 23 December, dissatisfied members of the Navy occupied the Chancellery and put the People's Deputies under house arrest. Ebert asked the OHL for help over the phone and troops assembled on the outskirts of the capital. During the night, Ebert then ordered these troops to attack, which they did in the morning of 24 December. When the fighting stopped in the afternoon, the Navy forces held the field, but they returned to their barracks, ending the crisis. As a result of this event, which Karl Liebknecht called Ebert's Bloody Christmas, the USBD members left the Council of the People's Deputies on 29 December. The next day, SPD members Gustav Noske and Rudolf Whistle took their place and from that point on, government communiques were signed Reichsregierung instead of Council of the People's Deputies. That same day, the Spartacists severed their remaining links with the USBD, and set themselves up as the Communist Party of Germany. The week of 5 the 12th of January 1919 became known as Spartacus Week, but historians view this as a misnomer. The Spartacist uprising was more an attempt by the Berlin workers to regain what they thought had been won in the November Revolution and what they now seemed to be in the process of losing. The trigger was a trivial event, the head of the Berlin police, a member of the USPD, refused to accept his dismissal. The USPD called for a demonstration of solidarity, but was itself surprised by the reaction as hundreds of thousands, many of them armed, gathered in the city centre on 5 January. They seized the newspapers and railway stations. 
representatives from the USBD and KPD decided to topple the EBIT government. However, the next day, the gathered masses did not seize government buildings, as the expected support from the military did not materialize. EBIT started to negotiate with the leaders of the uprising, but simultaneously prepared for military action. Noska was made commander of the Freikorps and Ebert worked to mobilize the regular armed forces of the Berlin area on the government's side. From 9 to 12 January on Ebert's orders, regular forces and Freikorps successfully and bloodily suppressed the uprising. Chapter 4, President of Germany In the first German presidential election, held on the 11th of February 1919, Five days after the Nationalversammlung convened in Weimar, Ebert was elected as provisional president of the German Republic. He remained in that position after the new constitution came into force and was sworn in as Reichspräsident on 21 August 1919. He was Germany's first ever democratically elected head of state, and was also the first commoner, the first socialist, the first civilian, and the first person from a proletarian background to hold that position. In the whole time of the unified German Reich's existence from 1871 to 1945, he was also the only head of state who was unequivocally committed to democracy. One of Ebert's first tasks as president was to deal with the Treaty of Versailles. When the treaty's terms became public on 7 May 1919, it was cursed by Germans of all political shades as an onerous diktat, particularly because Germany had essentially been handed the treaty and told to sign without any negotiations. Ebert himself denounced the treaty as unrealizable and unbearable. However, Ebert was well aware of the possibility that Germany would not be in a position to reject the treaty. He believed that the Allies would invade Germany from the West if Germany refused to sign. To appease public opinion, he asked Hindenburg if the army was capable of holding out if the Allies renewed hostilities. He promised to urge rejection of the treaty if there was even the remote possibility that the army could make a stand. Hindenburg, with some prodding from Gruner, concluded that the army was not capable of resuming the war even on a limited scale. Rather than tell Ebert himself, he dispatched Gruner to deliver the army's conclusion to the president. Ebert thus advised the National Assembly to approve the treaty, which it did by a large majority on 9 July. The government's fight against communist forces, as well as recalcitrant socialists, went on after Ebert became president. From January to May 1919, in some areas through the summer, civil war in Germany continued. Since 19 January elections had returned a solid majority for the Democratic parties, Ebert felt that the revolutionary forces had no legitimacy left. He and Noska now used the same forces they had earlier employed in Berlin on a national scale to dissolve the workers' councils and to restore law and order. In March 1920, during the right wing cap putsch by some Freikorps elements, the government, including Ebert, had to flee from Berlin. However, a refusal by civil servants to accept the self-declared government and a general strike called by the legitimate cabinet led to the collapse of the putsch. After it ended, striking workers in the Ruhr region refused to return to work. Led by members of the USPD and the KPD, they presented an armed challenge to the authority of the government. The government then sent Reichswehr and Freikorps troops to quell the Ruhr uprising by force. To avoid an election campaign at a critical time, the Reichstag extended his term of office on 24 October 1922 until 25 June 1925, with a qualified majority vote that changed the constitution. As president, Ebert appointed center right figures like Wilhelm Kuno and Hans Luther as chancellor and made rigorous use of his wide ranging powers under Article 48 of the Weimar Constitution. For instance, he used Article 48 powers to deal with the Cap Putsch and the Beer Hall Putsch. Through 1924, he used the presidency's emergency powers a total of 134 times. After the Civil War, he changed his politics to a policy of balance between the left and the right, between the workers and the owners of business enterprises. In that endeavor, he followed a policy of brittle coalitions. This resulted in some problems, such as the acceptance, 
during the crisis of 1923, by the SPD of longer working hours without extra compensation while the conservative parties ultimately rejected the other element of the compromise, the introduction of special taxes for the rich. Chapter 5 – Death Ebert suffered from gallstones and frequent bouts of cholecystitis. Vicious attacks by Ebert's right-wing adversaries, including slander and ridicule, were often condoned or even supported by the judiciary when Ebert sought redress through the court system. The constant necessity to defend himself against those attacks also undermined his health. In December 1924, a court in Magdeburg fined a journalist who had called Ebert a traitor to his country for his role in the January 1918 strike, but the court also said that, in terms of strict legalism, Ebert had in fact committed treason. These proceedings prevented him from seeking medical help for a while, as he wanted to be available to give evidence. Ebert became acutely ill in mid February 1925 from what was believed to be influenza. His condition deteriorated over the following two weeks, and at that time he was thought to be suffering from another episode of gallbladder disease. He became acutely septic on the night of 23 February, and underwent an emergency appendectomy in the early hours of the following day for what turned out to be appendicitis. Four days later, he died of septic shock, aged 54. The Reichspräsident was buried in Heidelberg. Several high ranking politicians and a trade union leader made speeches at his funeral, as did a Protestant minister, Hermann Maas, pastor at the Church of the Holy Spirit in Heidelberg. By thus taking part in the obsequies, Maas caused something of a scandal in his church and among political conservatives, because Ebert had been an outspoken atheist. Chapter 6 Friedrich Ebert Foundation Ebert's policy of balancing the political factions during the Weimar Republic is seen as an important archetype in the SPD. Today, the SPD associated Friedrich Ebert Foundation, Germany's largest and oldest party affiliated foundation, which, among other things, promotes students of outstanding intellectual ability and personality, is named after Ebert. Chapter 7 Controversy about the Freikorps collaboration. Ebert remains a controversial figure to this day. While the SPD recognizes him as one of the founders and keepers of German democracy whose death in office was a great loss, others argue that he paved the way for National Socialism by supporting the Freikorps and their suppression of worker uprisings. Ebert effectively allied himself with forces that considered the Republic tainted beyond redemption for being associated with the national humiliation of November 1918 and the Treaty of Versailles. They also failed to thank him for working with them in suppressing the more radical leftist groups. As a social democrat, Ebert was considered to be a political enemy by conservative and nationalistic groups. They subsequently claimed that the German working class, supported by the SPD, was responsible for Germany's defeat in World War I. The alleged proof of this Dolchstoss legend was found in a number of strikes during 1917, and 1918 which had partly disrupted production in the imperial German armaments industry. The aim of the striking workers, and their socialist allies was said to have been to turn the German Empire into a Soviet Socialist Republic. In addition, it had been the majority parties of the Reichstag that formally asked for the ceasefire in October 1918 and it had been the civilian government rather than the military which represented Germany, in the ceasefire negotiations of November 1918. Most historians, however, agree that military defeat was inevitable after the US had joined the war against Germany. Some historians have defended Ebert's actions as unfortunate but inevitable if the creation of a socialist state on the model that had been promoted by Rosa Luxemburg, Karl Liebknecht and the communist Spartacists was to be prevented. Leftist historians like Bernd Engelmann, as well as mainstream ones like Sebastian Hafner on the other hand, have argued that organized communism was not yet politically relevant in Germany at the time. However, the actions of Ebert and his Minister of Defense, Gustav Noske, against the insurgents contributed to the radicalization of the workers and to increasing support for communistic ideas. Although the Weimar Constitution provided for the establishment of workers' councils on different levels of society, they did not play a major part in the political life of the Weimar Republic. 
Ebert always regarded the institutions of parliamentary democracy as a more legitimate expression of the will of the people, workers' councils, as a product of the revolution, were only justified in exercising power for a transitive period. All power to all the people. Was the slogan of his party, in contrast to the slogan of the far left, all power to the councils. In Ebert's opinion only reforms, not a revolution, could advance the causes of democracy and socialism. He therefore has been called a traitor by leftists, who claim he paved the way for the ascendancy of the far right and even of Adolf Hitler, whereas those who think his policies were justified claim that he saved Germany from Bolshevik excesses. Chapter 8 Literature Wolfgang Abendroth, Friedrich Ebert In, Wilhelm von Sternberg, Die Deutschen Kanzler Von Bismarck bis Kohl. Aufbau Taschenbuch Verlag, Berlin 1998, ISBN 3-7466-8032-8, pages 145-159. Friedrich Ebert. Sein Leben, Sein Werk, Sein Zeit. Begleitband zur Standard in Osterlung in der Reichspräsident Friedrich Ebert Gedenkstadt, edited by Walter Mühlhausen. Kara Verlag, Heidelberg 1999, ISBN 3933257034. Kula, Henning, Deutschland auf dem Weg zu sich selbst. Einer John de Gieskeit. Hornheim Verlag, Stuttgart slash Leipzig 2002, ISBN 389850578. Eberhard Kolb. Friedrich Ebert ALS Reichspräsident, Amtsführung and Amtsverstandnis. Oldenburg Wissenschaftsverlag, Munchen 1997, ISBN 3486560173. Containing Richter, Ludwig, der Reichspräsident bestimmt die Politik und der Reichskanzler deckt sie, Friedrich Ebert und die Bildung der Weimarer Koalition. Mulhausen, Walter, Das Bureau de Reichspräsidentin in der Politischen Auseinandersetzung. Kolb, Eberhard, vom Vollorfigen zum Definitiven Reichspräsidentin. Die Auseinandersetzung um die Volkswahl de Reichspräsidentin 1919-1922. Braun, Berndt, Integration Kraft Repräsentation, der Reichspräsident in den Ländern. Hurton, Heinz, Reichspräsident und Weipolitik. Zur Praxis der Personalauslies. Richter, Ludwig, das Präsidial Note für Ordnungsrecht in den ersten Jahren der Weimarer Republik. Friedrich Ebert und die Anwendung des Artikels 48 der Weimarer Reichsverfassung. Mulhausen, Walter, Reichspräsident und Sozialdemokratie, Friedrich Ebert und Sein Partei 1919-1925. Georg Kotowski, Friedrich Ebert, Neue Deutsche Biographie, 4, Berlin, Dunker and Humblot, pages 254-256. Mulhausen, Walter Friedrich Ebert 1871-1925. Reichspräsident der Weimarer Republic. Dietz, Bonn 2006, ISBN 3-8012-4164-5. Mulhausen, Walter, Die Republik in Trauer. Der Todd der Ersten Reichspräsident in Friedrich Ebert. Stiftung Reichspräsident Friedrich Ebert Gedenkstadt, Heidelberg 2005, ISBN 3928808284.